All right. Well, welcome to the show today, everyone. My guest today is Richard Turnbull, originally a senior management consultant at Ernst & Young. He left corporate life to pursue various startup ventures and today is the founder and CEO of The Restored. It's a company looking to empower people to restore their four foundations of health, which are sleep, nutrition, movement, and mindset. I wanted to bring Richard on the show to find out why he left corporate life to focus on his own businesses, the challenges he's faced along the way, and what he's doing now with The Restored. So Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you, James. Appreciate that. I'm always so impressed with your intros. Your research is excellent. I remember uh, Alex Icon said the same, that you, you tend to know more <laughs> about the people coming on than the actual people themselves. So yeah, excellent summary. Yeah, Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that. So um, I was wondering if we could just start a little bit about your background and your story, Richard. So could you maybe just tell us briefly what you were up to and what your story was before you got into the world of online businesses? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I was born and, and, and still live in the UK. Um, I, had a, a, I actually live in, in Winchester, which is near Southampton, uh, down south. I did a, a business degree at Reading University. The reason I, I chose that degree is because it was the only business degree in the UK that involved setting up a, a business as part of it, which was a fantastic experience. Uh, of course, it didn't turn out to be the business, but it, it was still a great learning experience. Um, by doing that uh, business, what it enabled me to do is stand out to recruiters. So when I was looking for summer internships whilst at university, um, I went through a very long interview process with a company called Price Whitehouse Coopers, which uh, are one of the big accountants, but I was in their management consultancy arm. I ended up getting a job with them. I uh, was fortunate enough to uh, defer my uh, start date for a year and then did some incredible traveling, spent a lot of time in Australia and all, all around the world, and then started my path there and then eventually went on to their um, competitors, Ernst Young, their management consulting arm, just, just handling huge budgets for someone quite young that, that I just, at the time, didn't realize how big the projects were. Like, I was a project manager for Shell, for example, and, and, and managing multi-million pound products at, at, at 21. So incredible experience. Um, but again, it's only looking back, I, re I realize how great an experience that was. Um, I stayed there for about five years. And as I said, because it was such good, great experience, it, it went by very quickly. And I started to realize that I was getting further and further away from that original entrepreneurial uh, instinct and um, then then i started to explore a bit more the entrepreneurial path that's ended me where i am now yeah yeah that's interesting so so you said yourself you were always kind of had a bit of an entrepreneurial itch so i was curious did you did you just kind of think that did you actually look at it that logically and think i just need to work here for a bit to kind of get this great experience as a management consultant and then i'll go into my own thing or were you really thinking ahead or was it kind of just the thing to do no it wasn't at all that sounds very planned out doesn't it in hindsight what actually happened is is I knew I wanted to do something in business and like most people I didn't didn't know what exactly uh, when I was young I was inspired by reading the books of people like Richard Branson and you know many of the names that that most people would say uh, but I didn't know what it was exactly that I wanted to do and it, it was more a thing of whilst I'm figuring that out I'll go down the path that will get me some good skills and and earn some money and pay off some student debt in the meantime so what happened is whilst at university you go to the careers library and, and all the advice there are, here's the big companies that everyone's trying to get into my competitive instinct took over and I thought right okay I'm gonna gonna get one of those slots and um yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it was really revealing, actually. I remember the last interview I had with one of the partners at the big firms who got me in and just straight away said, look, you've got all the grades, et cetera. I'm not really interested in that. Tell me about this cool business you started up. And, <laughs> and, and looking back, I think that was a, a glimpse into that partner's um, regret, perhaps. I think he was, he was just <laughs> trying to live through me of, wow, what, what cool thing I wish I'd done. And, and um I, again, those companies are great for really building up basic skills like, uh, you know, just, just getting organized and, and, and communication and a lot of transferable skills. 
the problem is the longer you stay there, the harder it is to leave because the salaries go up. And it kind of yeah. you meet that tipping point where you have to make a decision and almost start from scratch again. So it's not for everyone that route, but it's a very common route in the UK to go from university to one of the bigger firms that just offer training and and, and again meeting other other people that, that that have similar views. So it was more a path that was an obvious one to follow as opposed to a I'm going to do it for this amount of time before being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Makes sense. And that's funny, you mentioned that the, the old golden handcuffs, <laughs> it does get to a point where you, it's hard to go back to nothing when, you, when you're making that money, so I get that. So why, well, so we know why you wanted to leave Ernst & Young, but what was that process actually like? Did you have a plan or did you just kind of burn the ships and, <laughs> and see what happened? Yeah, so I, I did burn the ships actually, and, and, and that wasn't completely intentional. It, it wasn't a uh, knock over the table, see you later, I'm never coming back here conversation. But it was more a realization that I didn't, it, it, it was an intense job, and I didn't have the mental space to think what I wanted to do with my time. So I actually handed in my notice to my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, did the same with, with her job for a diff, uh, completely different industry, and we, we, we were renting in London, so we, we gave notice on our flat and we thought, right, we'll, we'll go traveling for, we stayed up enough for four to six months and we'll go traveling and we'll work it out. We'll have enough space to think what, what's next. We just really didn't know what we were going to do. We, we knew we were um, needed a change is, is, is all we needed. Um, and actually, we we're thinking more along the lines of where do we want to live as well? We, we were in London and, and that was great for a few years, but do we want to be in Australia? That was that was the big thought at the time. So I, I handed my notice on good terms. So I could have gone back, um, but I kind of made it clear to everyone that I was close to that 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 would have been failure. Uh, so I left the door a little bit open. It wasn't burned completely, but internally it would have felt like failure going back. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I I always feel that you know burning your bridges is good psychology to go, right, I'm going to hit, hit a good stop. Uh, I don't think, you, maybe there's a British side coming at me, I don't think you need to do it in a rude way all the time. You know, there, there's the temptation to email everyone and say, I'm gone, suckers, I'm, I'm never oh. coming back. And, uh, and do it in such a way so you're forced never to be able to go back there. I think there's a way of doing it that it, it, it's still leaving on good terms. And also, I, I, companies I've left in the past, I've, I've had people that actually have come and worked with me in the future so the company I have now I've got uh, two people from a previous company I've worked with so if I'd you know left on bad terms of everyone it would have not sent a great message to them so it was an intentional yes cut let's go and actually work out what's next but in a way that was um, in a good way in my opinion yep makes total sense so did traveling around, did that give you some clarity on what you wanted to do next or what was your kind of, what was your next moves after you traveled around for a bit? Well, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm a naturally creative person. I'm not, I think there's different types of entrepreneurs out there. I, I'm certainly a process driven entrepreneur in that I like to follow a plan that, that's tried and tested and, and, and I'm not going to pretend I'm an entrepreneur that comes up a hundred new ideas a day. So going in and getting inspiration was hard at first. I was I mean, enjoying traveling. And fortunately, I came across a book that just changed it all for me. A book that, that you, you'll probably hear a lot of on this podcast. I know it's already been mentioned a few times. And that was Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. Uh, mm -hmm. It was my mid 20s. I was traveling. I had so much space to think. It just couldn't have been a better time for me to come across that book. Um, I, I think a lot of People get different things out of it. For me, it, it was that process side. It was seeing the steps to take and actually following it. It's one of those books that you have to actually do the things it tells you to in there rather than reading it and go, oh, that's a nice idea. I followed all the steps and I, I actually did something. I actually set up a few online businesses whilst traveling. And wow. it, 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 it was one of those moments that I was sat on the beach and, you know, we had enough time. We had a few months where we didn't do a lot. We saw some great things, ate some great food and met some great people. But I was getting to that point where I was getting a, a, not bored, but just thinking of, right, what was this next thing? And um, so 
what I do is just spend half an hour in, in an internet cafe um, just starting to do the first steps of this. And, and what I set up was a few online businesses. Um, mm. They're essentially ebooks online. One was about healthy eating. Um, but the, the one that really took off was called The Swimmer's Body. It was mm. a case of, 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 again, following the steps in the book at the time, which was a bit of market research into which body shape would get the most, uh, would be the biggest market. And we were looking at mm. testing gymnast body shape. And um, it was between gymnasts and, and, and swimmers in the end. And swimmers had the most search volume. So uh, a friend of mine created the actual content. He was a, he was a nutritionist and a, and a personal trainer. We created this ebook together and I created the site and um, I'm not particularly technical, but just using online tools. And then we set up an affiliate network and um, it took off. It, mm. it, it was my first taste of, of, of real success of, of okay, I've, I've tried a few little things here, but I've gone through this really methodical approach and um, it was starting to make some money. And, and, and uh, in context, it was making money for someone living in Thailand at the time. We, we'd come to kind of that four, four five month period of uh, traveling where our funds were running out. Unfortunately, this this ebook enabled us to travel uh, for nine months in total. So it funded the the exact four hour uh, four hour work week lifestyle that Tim Ferriss talks of. So sat on a beach, a typical day would be you know having having some fresh fruit and smoothies and and uh, a nice balanced breakfast, and then then going for a swim in the beach, spending some time with my wife, just just relaxing and catching up. Then an hour in the internet cafe, then some kickboxing in the afternoon, and 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 then just dinner and just chilling out on the beach watching a movie. It, it was literally what most people aspire to have as as the free lifestyle. So uh, yeah, that, that 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 I can certainly recommend that book for anyone in that mindset of uh, um, inspiration. Um, but the key being, you have to have enough mental space to to put those things into action. It, it is it is all about taking action on that book. Yeah. That's cool. It's a cool story, and it's it's definitely true. I've I've found that myself as well. When when you make sure, when you have extra mental space, it, you really do absorb a lot more information, and you actually do kind of tend to take a lot more action on. I found for myself personally. What what do you think for someone who? Because I guess it was good timing for you because you were you were already on traveling and you kind of had this mental headspace so it was kind of great timing that the book came into your life at that point what do you think if someone's just living their regular life like they're working like a, a busy job and they don't have as much mental space you got any thoughts about how someone can kind of I guess cultivate that a bit more and and be be open to to new ideas and being able to implement them have you ever thought about that I have because at, at later stages in in in, uh, in my life I've had kind of milestones where I've had similar similar um, challenges and a lot of it is 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 going back to that original inspiration. Uh, for me, and I can't say this works for everyone. It's it's all about immersion. So if if you want to uh, learn how to swim, uh, I think you can you can do swimming lessons once a week, but you would learn a lot more by taking five days. And just just really, you know, spending five days with learning different ways of doing it. But it's that immersion of really going into something and, and that being your main focus. So in the past, for me, when I needed that that readjustment or that that, that look at to what is the most important direction to take next, I've actually taken a week off work. So I remember doing that with with my finances a, um, a few years ago. I read. Uh, a book that if you're, if you're looking for long-term, sustainable, uh, compounding return on your money, I recommend the book called, I think it's called Money by Tony Robbins. And that that is a lot about pensions and things like that, but it's more about investing early and, and compounding just small amounts early. I actually took a week off just to devour that book and actually commit to myself that by the end of that week, everything will be set up. Because a lot of these mm. things are, I'll, I'll, I'll read it, I'll do a bit here, a bit there, you get distracted and you realise a few months have gone by and I've done 20% of it. And that 20% is great. Uh, I'm a big fan of the 80-20 principle about, you know, focusing on the things that are going to give you the 20% the, the of effort that's going to give you the 80% of results. Um, so I think, you know, for me, I've got certain places I go, I'll take, I'll take a few days off. 
and it's got to be a long enough period that you know you're not going to be uh, distracted by something else. So, you know, if, if you take a day off, you know that that thing you started the day before is going to come back the, the day after. So taking a, a, a reasonable at a time to really think about it. And I, I have a few thought exercises I go through on that. Uh, a lot of it for me is not just what, what business to do, but how I spend my time. So one, one thought exercise I do uh, whenever I, I, I'm thinking, you know, I haven't done it for a long time. And, and it's certainly something I recommend uh, to a few people who have asked me similar things in the past is to, is to physically write down what your ideal ideal day would be. Yeah. And, and, and that's so powerful because what it does is is if you go into absolute detail of that, it really does clarify the things you want to do, but it, it clarifies things you don't want to do. So yeah. for me, um, after I had that success with, with that early uh, ebook, I think I did a version of that there where I thought, well, what would my ideal day be? At the time, the ideal day was sitting on a beach and that was awesome. But actually, believe it or not, you do get bored of that after, after doing it for, for four months. It, it, was, uh, it was something that, that was great for a while, but you look for the next thing. And for me, it was, well, I miss working with great people. So uh, let's go into detail of that. You know, do I want to work from home or do I actually want to be in an office with great people? What, what time do I want to wake up? I, I actually am not an all early morning person. Now I have children, so that's slightly uh, out of my, my hands. But <laughs> going into detail of what time do I want to wake up? What time What do I want to start my day doing? What, what time do I want to leave the house? Do I want to accept that I'm going to be in commuter traffic? And if that's fine if I've got a podcast. But for me, that's my idea of hell. I want to leave the house when I've missed the traffic. And when I get to work, what's the first 90 minutes of my day look like? I read into real detail and that exercise was a real eye opener because it actually narrowed down my my choices, which is fantastic. When when you're overwhelmed with all these things you can do, it's incredibly helpful to go, well, what would an amazing day look like? A work day look like? And think, well, okay, well that actually narrowed down the businesses that I'm interested in because, you know, if if I'm only obsessed by this particular industry, does that mean I have to be in this location? So so for me, it's about immersion, taking the time to probably think about it and thinking about what's the result, not, not just the business or the idea. What, what does that mean for you and your time? So I, I think you, need, you do need that mental space. There's no, there's no avoiding it. Yeah, that's great. Those are, those are excellent uh, tips there. I think make it, creating that space, as you said, you can't avoid it. You've got to actually make the space and then... That's a powerful exercise as well, what you, what you went through defining your perfect day. Not many people do that, I think. So it's, it, it's so important because how can you, otherwise you end up just being a drifter really. And like, if you don't have a vision of what your perfect day is, how can you ever get that perfect day? So I love that. That's great. I'll give you an example of, of, of how I learned that the hard way in that I, I, I've, I've had some jobs since then that are jobs. I mean, they're essentially... I was an entrepreneur in-house for a company. I was the CEO of a venture-backed startup. So AOL's first uh, major investment in Europe, I was brought in as the uh, CEO of, of that startup. So, you, so you, on paper, wow, what an incredible opportunity, entrepreneur, all the rest of it. But my typical day meant that I was managing a team, a development team based in India. So my typical day was working from home on the hours suited to my team in, 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 in India. And also, uh, I was on the phone communicating with different people. And what I realized is my typical day meant I was in my home office, not seeing anyone. And, and it, it drove me insane. It, it was it, on, on, from external, externally, it was the dream. It was the dream uh, position, but actually physically going through what you have to deliver and what you do that day. It just didn't suit me at all. So again, I think I, it was one of those moments where I'd redid that exercise and, and made some time to think about what I want to spend my time doing because that's what it comes down to a lot of it is how you're spending your time is is, is the only thing you, you know you can't get back that made me realize that, that it wasn't right and um, I needed to move on to the next thing. So yeah, I'm not pretending that once you do it once, you're fixed for good. But it's just a great thing to do when you're in that, that headspace of, Shit, what's next? Sorry, can I swear on the <laughs> just Yeah, go that. ahead. Yeah, so it's, it's what's next. Want. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's great advice. So 
When did you first start getting into selling physical products online? I believe the there was a Shopify build a business competition that kind of kicked things off for you. Is that true? That is true. And I've no idea how you found that out. How <laughs> Your research <laughs> is incredible. Um, well, I mean, again, talking about finding mental space to do it. I, I was away with with Naomi, my wife and my best friend and, and his now wife. And we just took a long weekend away. And and. Wow, I really have no idea how you found that out. That's impressive. <laughs> and um, I dig deep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I realise what's online. And um, I remember being away in this, this um, is, a, is a holiday park, and and I said to them that there's this cool competition, and 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 one of the prizes was to meet Tim Ferriss, who of course is 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 a great inspiration for, for me from that book, and 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 a few other great mentors. And I thought oh, I've got to win this competition. I'll, I'll get to the punchline. I didn't win the competition, but still, it, it 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 inspired me at the right time. So I was away for that weekend, and 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 we tried a few brainstorms and tried to get everyone. I said, look, I, I will buy you all a beer if you can help me come up with this idea. And actually, what happened is, I went and sat by a pool for a while and went through a very methodical uh, process, which was right. Okay, this product needs to be this sort of size for shipping. It needs to be this. It needs to be that. And um, uh, the the idea I came up with originally was incredible. Uh, the first idea from that weekend was was a few, but it was something to do with yoga mats, and uh, very un unoriginal. And mm-hmm. I realised that my subconscious had picked that up from the Tim Ferriss blog. And I went back to the Tim Ferriss blog, and there was a guy who was highlighted by Tim as as someone who'd really delivered on on the four hour work week uh, wording of a muse. So in the book, they talk about creating a, a product or, or, or a service that you're, that's not reliant on your time. And that, that muse gives you enough cash and funding and it's set up in such an automated way that it, it enables that, that lifestyle. And I remember it was only after that weekend I came back and, and realized that, that it was because there was someone I'd read about on there who was selling yoga mats. <laughs> Matt, massive yoga mats I should point out that they're for like studios or, or, or large rooms mm-hmm. and um, I, had a, I had a few other ideas and, and a lot of it was driven by personal need I had a lot of back pain at the time from from again I was still at that startup where I was um, managing people remotely from my home and just spent all day on, on a terrible office chair my back was killing me um, my, my young son at the time was only six months old and it got to the point I couldn't pick him out the cot because oh. my my back was hurting me so much so it was it was so clear that that was an issue to solve it didn't uh, it it didn't highlight to me that that was necessarily the business idea at the time so um i i reached out to this guy who was a entrepreneur as i said featured on 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 the blog and said to him um as as i always recommend people do how can i add value to you i've got a few ideas of how i can add value i see you've got a business I'd love to work for you for free on the side. I'd love to do some stuff for you for free. I'd love to, I've had, I've looked at your business and got some few ideas. I think you should do this, think that. I basically just tried to add so much value to him up front without asking for anything. It it, it was an intentional, you know, a lot of people approach uh, me and I've seen it with, with other entrepreneurs. I know it's, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Well, a cup of coffee isn't adding much value. It's, you know, it's (laughs) buying me something for a few, few pounds um but buy actually, yeah i could buy my own coffee and also it takes a lot of my time and um uh, essentially the value that oh, i would give is very one-sided so uh, what, what i always recommend is when you reach out to someone just reach out and, and try to over index in the value you give to them first and and if they don't give anything back well you've still got you know good karma out there adding a lot of value and essentially, I, I helped this guy a little bit, but, but, but I also asked the question, what can I do to add value to you? And he, he was writing a book at the time about entrepreneurs and more importantly, following this process he had of how to create a physical product. And um, I said to him, I had a few ideas. One was a type of yoga mat. I also said to him about a seat cushion that helped with back pain. He said, tell me more. So, so he, he understood from that, that it, that was coming from a place of, of really trying to solve a, a significant problem for me. Um, I, it wasn't a, from a lack of trying. I'd bought every product out there. And, and I realized that 
there was an opportunity to combine about three or four products to essentially create an unstable seat cushion that, that kind of kept me moving. Um, and he said, look, the biggest thing you can do for me is, is do that product, but I will, I will mentor you. And in exchange, you have to share with me every single detail, every costing, everything, be very open and I'll use it in this book. Mm. I mean, I mean, how could I say no to that? That was such an incredible offer. And yeah. um, I, I did it. It took a huge amount of time. And this is something that I always warn other entrepreneurs that it will always take a lot longer than, than you think. And that's one of the many reasons I didn't win the Shopify Build a Business competition, just simply because the amount of time it took to, to uh, source and test and, and prototype and sell the first batch and then use that money to get the next batch. Of course, doing it out of your own money means that you can't, well, I didn't have enough money to get the second order in until I sold the first order and, and it was like a three to four month lead in time every time. So that was an incredible experience of product development from a mentor who'd been there, done that. So yeah, that competition was the inspiration, definitely. So uh, yeah, again, amazed you knew that, <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I troll the I troll the internet to to find these things. <laughs> well what, one, of was... the, one of the things we spoke about just for the call is 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 intentional from my point that there's not much about me online. Um because I've done a few podcasts a few years ago and I, I was a bit inundated after that about a lot of people asking for mentorship or or, or um coming to work at the company and, and, and things like that. And it was a bit overwhelming, to be honest. And and it was it was only afterwards that I realized it was that whole value added uh, uh, thing. And and from my point of view, if I do anything, I really, really want to add a lot of value. So we talked before the call about how, what it is your audience would would most uh, want and get from this. And for me, I really want to deliver on making sure that if I do anything, it really does significantly help people. So there's tools and, and processes I've gone through that I'd love to share, but intentionally, um, to contact me, it's always through through the company, through our brand. Uh, if you look at my own personal Instagram, I don't think I've posted on there for seven months or something, which which is why, again, I'm so impressed you you found anything out because it's an intentional thing that I want to help as many people who have been in the same situations as I have through things like this. But on a one-to-one -one level, I, I really have you know, members in my own organization that, that I want to help. And, and also, I think it's important to um have your own path i think that that's so important uh, i'm yeah. a big big fan of modeling a huge fan of modeling but you can model through books you can model through remotely from learning what people are doing you can model for from people at your work and i've been fortunate enough to have thousands of of, of inspiring people but maybe tens of people that that without realizing it mentored me simply because i've worked with them and, and just picked up on what they're doing and i've added value to them and they coached me a little bit but we've never called it a coach or, or mentor but but I intentionally just went to them and, and and it wasn't about copying everything they do but it was for that one thing I want to learn you know I will model them and, and find out about it but um, again it's all about adding value up front yeah absolutely and I think um, yeah so the the importance of, of mentors definitely when you have when you have someone that you can learn from specifically, it helps a lot. Um, and what I was curious about was what, what happened with that, that, uh, that's the, the back cushion. Did you, did that, um, did you end up following through on that business? How did it go? What was sort of your, what happened next with that? That was something like seven years ago. I'm, I'm 38 now. I think I was the early thirties. That is, is, is a typical four hour work week product is still on sale now i do i haven't yeah. touched it for about four years yeah i have i have i have uh, again for me the surprising as i said people get different things out of that book for me what it opened my eyes on was automation and most importantly leveraging worldwide teams so in that book it talks you know about having the best people but from different countries and different time zones so that product is only sold in america and so i have people in america doing customer service for it and and returns and then someone else in uh, china who does the uh, manufacturing and and someone else in india who does the logistics and 
it's so automated it it, it, it it's uh yeah i haven't even thought about it for three years to be honest um wow. that 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 didn't get to that overnight like i said it took a long time of the, the biggest challenge in physical products from my point of view is is the lead in times if if you're creating something that um is is anything bigger than a shoebox is a great great barometer is anything bigger than a shoebox you have to think about transportation by by ships and shipping which is you know china to america or uk or or europe is another month and then unloading is another week and manufacturing of that sort of thing is six to six weeks to three months so any anything you want on sale you've got to have ordered it three to five months beforehand so the lead in times are huge which ties up a lot of capital whereas smaller products anything smaller than a shoebox uh reduces the time of things like if you're in an emergency you could get it air shipped over and and, and it's, it's uh, and that that um painful experience with with the car uh, with the seat cushion actually inspired the next product so so the next product was was a back support and, and that was once i highly recommend to people just just get going because what happened is you can spend forever doing research and the best research out there is customer feedback so so all these customers who are buying the seat cushion i was i was actually reading their reviews and i was getting their feedback and, and a few of them said well it's great for when i'm sitting but my biggest challenge is when i'm up and moving my back still hurts and i've got the fear of i've got the fear of movement and and if you've got back pain what you need to do is move you need to do your uh, physio stretches you need to get rid of the lactic acid by moving but if, if your back's hurting that much that you you are afraid of putting it out then you're actually in a downward spiral so it was a result of that feedback that that uh i i created the, the, a back support and and again a lot of tools and and product research went into that to create something that was double adjusted so it actually gave you that extra support it, it, it was a lot of back and forth with customers and, and that's when things really took off because that is a physical product that is small to ship it was a product that had such huge notable benefits to people that the reviews were just incredible and once you start getting great customer results and feedback and reviews and you don't have to really you know in incentivize or encourage for that things just really compound and and i was able to reorder quickly and what happened very quickly is i had i was still working full time but i had a business selling um back supports for and it was selling about 20 twenty thousand pounds a month on back supports wow. um and that probably took eight months to get to that point whereas the the, cut, the seat cushion probably took about two and a half years to get to ten thousand a month so yeah right i would never have got to that point with the back supports if i hadn't have gone through that hard pain with the uh with the other one so i always think it takes longer than 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 you expect um, which is why I'm a big fan of, of st just starting now, because if you wait another <laughs> until it's perfect, then, then you'll be adding that on to the end. So start now. And I'm also a big fan of not throwing your job in just to start this new venture, because the new venture yeah. will take a lot longer to get the money you want from it to replace that, yeah. that, in that, that income. So I, I, I often recommend, depending on the type of business, to, to start the business on the side, yeah. So you take that time off to have that thought space and realize what it is and then just start and then, and then use the, the, your salary and your, your, your money coming in to fund that business and accelerate it to you're at that point where, well, I've just, you know, I've got to go and really go for this business because it's, it's going so well, as opposed mm -hmm. to I hate my job. I want to leave it, start this new business tomorrow. Oh, no, two years time. It's still not making money. So, yeah, that that's. Yeah, that that, that's come for a lot of pain to come to that realization. <laughs> it's good advice because it's easy to, um, yeah, to, to kind of have that mindset of just, yeah, let's burn the ships and go all in. But it puts you in that position where you can start to make short term decisions for pure necessity of wanting cash to, <laughs> to pay, pay the rent and pay for food on the table. So, the longer you can delay that, if you can fund it, as you said, with this salary and work on it on the side, you're going to have a much longer sustainable view of the business. And um, yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. So it's good advice. Yeah. And what, what was also great is, is 
is at the point in time that the business is going particularly well, I realized that going back to my previous experience about wanting to work with great people, that I wanted to not just spend my time doing back supports. I mean, I still have passion for that problem, helping people with solving their movement. It's, it's a bit broader than that now, people who got, are in pain. So helping people with their movement, their nutrition and their sleep is, is what drives me because they're issues mm. I've had in the past. So it, 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 it's, it's, it's always something you want to improve on. It's not fixing them all. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a case of coming back to, to what drives you again. Yep, makes sense. How have you, how are you such a, a systems thinker? Because it sounds like you are very systems oriented, which is, is great for a business person, obviously. Is that just the way you're wired? Have you always been that way? Or have you got a system for being <laughs> systems thinking? Or how do you kind of think about systems? <laughs> uh, you're right. I absolutely am. And, and it took me a long time to embrace that and realize that. Um, I went to a couple of Tony Robbins events this year. And he categorizes entrepreneurs as three types. And, and what it made me realize is I embrace the type I am and, and kind of Lever, uh, it's kind of work with the other types to get get the most out of it. Um, entrepreneur is a broad term is is quite an appealing term nowadays. But actually, if you break it down into his terminology, he calls it either an entrepreneur, a manager, leader, or an artist. And in those definitions, an on, a, a more traditional entrepreneur loves the idea of of a high high risk, high reward business. The idea of it doesn't really matter what industry you're in. It's all about creating something that's a rocket ship and, and, a, and not risk averse at all. It's about creating the, the fastest startup that, that's going to blow the world away and they're going to be on the front cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. Um, the, the manager leader is, is the process person, the guy who, or the female who thinks about creating something bigger than themselves and it's about putting in place systems that, that make something incredible and it's, it, it very, very matters what industry they're in it has to be something that drives them it has to be delivering value to to, to customers and importantly del also delivering value internally creating a place for people internally to feel like they're helping customers so that's that's very much what i realized i was and um and embrace that and the final one is 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 an artist someone who who is driven by the creative and that's someone like perhaps Alex and Mimi Icon who it's, it's more about the product and the, and the creating value and, and, and communicating that. So uh, actually, interestingly, statistically, artists tend to make the, the most money out of, out of those three. They're the ones who are kind of the, the pinnacle. If you look at in sports arenas, for example, it's those artists, those one or two, you know, the messies of the world, the, 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 the people who inspire tend, tend to be um the ones that made the most money but all three of them have a place in business and i think what it is is not trying to put yourself in a box you're not i always used to want to have the tag entrepreneur and i think it's a it's a broad term now uh, the way you get there has to work for you I, I i think my process um methodology comes back to when i was working with those big companies i was trained as a project manager and it was about delivering the result so i'm assessed about getting the the end result and what's the steps to get there? And I've kind of got my own theories on 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 steps and processes for everything. Just because I've I've uh, yeah modelled other people mm -hmm. who have done done that before. Mm -hmm. Makes total sense. There was something I heard you say where you basically uh, this may may or may not be true. Correct me if it's wrong, but you tend to approach creating businesses with the goal of selling them and not necessarily actually wanting to sell them, but just having that mindset of, if we are going to sell this one day, there needs to be good systems in place and it needs to be something that someone else, you can remove yourself from the business and it can still run. So is that, is that true, do you think, in that way? And do you think that's a good way of approaching business? I, I, uh, th that's half true. I, 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 uh, I absolutely do think in the way of being a, business owner rather than a business runner. And that comes from a book called The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. Are you familiar with that book? Mm. Um, what, what that talks about, and again, that's perhaps where the systems thinking comes from, is that if you are creating a business and at the, at the beginning, you will do everything. That's just the way a business works is, is the first time something's done, it makes sense for you, you to do it and you learn it and then you can brief other people on it. 
Um, but if you're going with the mindset, I'm going to do everything and I'm the best person to do it, um, which may be true, depending on what it is, it, what you're actually doing is creating yourself a job. And, and, and the challenge with that is you can't scale. So um, the, the way the E-Myth Revisited looks at it is, yes, you should absolutely think of, of um, removing yourself from the day-to-day -day delivery. And actually, the four-hour work week talks about automating things that if you're starting to do something repeatedly and regularly, can you document that? Can you create a video on how to do it? Uh, and can you empower someone else to do it? And actually, after a while, they tend to do it better than you because they do it so regularly. Um, so my mentality is less about, you know, creating a business to sell every time, but it's creating a business that's not completely reliant on me, which does make it a sellable business. But the, the, the driving force on, on that is, again, coming from that management leader psychology of creating something much bigger than me. I mean, I, I, I think I'm, I'm at a lot of value on taking business from zero to, um, so 30, 40, 50 million pounds as, as a business. That, that's kind of my, my sweet spot because a lot of that is all about setting up systems and, and creating a kind of a mission and, and really inspiring people to come and, and join that mission and creating something that is adding so much significant value for our customers that, that it kind of, you know, feeds the, into the back end and people come back to us and, and the business grows. Once you kind of get beyond that, it, it, it gets into a kind of medium sized company and it gets a bit political for me. So uh, I, I think for me, uh, I haven't got beyond that level, but maybe uh, I will change in a few years time. But for me, it's all about when you go into setting up a business, it's very hard sometimes to let things go and let other people do stuff. Um, Fortunately, I've been in that position where I've been forced to do that. So um, some of my businesses, I've just not been in the location, like selling and doing returns in America. I wasn't in the location to do it. Some of the time it's been because I've had a day job and I just don't have the time to do it. So in the evening, I would have to you know, write a, a brief uh, to someone else to do it because I wouldn't be around during the day the next time to do it. So some of it is, is being forced to do it. And I've kept that and, and I encourage my team to think of of doing it in that way in the case of when when we want to create something great let's create something but don't feel that you're tied into continually creating that create it you keep delivering on that and when it's getting to a point it becomes routine document it and you move on to the next thing and someone else picks it up so it's a mentality for growth more than anything mm, makes total sense and You've had a few different business ideas and a few different businesses you've you've started over the years. So I was wondering if you do you actually have a system for generating business ideas? I do. Uh, this has been my uh, patented. Uh, system. <laughs> it's one of those things that again, I, I, this has worked for me, and and I highly recommend it as as something to help clarify thought process for people that 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 need inspiration. So. As I said, if you're uh, what was classed as an entrepreneur, you're probably having a thousand ideas a day and that's not, not a challenge. For me, I, I don't feel my I, I am a hundred ideas a day person, so I need those steps to go through. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, for me, it's starting with the end in mind. There's, there's, there's a fantastic book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, which I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, what that's about is about physically writing down your goals. And there's a lot of exercises to do in that book. But, but again, if you do the exercises, you, you will get so much more out of it. And, what, and it's a lot about daily affirmations and visualization. And for me, knowing at least what your next biggest goal is and having that in front of you, being clear and, and, and clarifying what, where you want to go is, is, the, is the first step. Then, and then it's kind of step two, I suppose, if, if we're looking at it in a process, <laughs> is modeling. So it's finding out people that have already achieved what you want, what you want to do. And, and, and one thing that, that, that's taken me a long time to realize is not one person is like to, to have achieved all those goals. So say you've got, you know, the goal of this, this perfect house or this car or this business that's given you the lifestyle that's got this typical day or this industry that you're the spokesperson for. It's very unlikely that one person's done all of it and that's your perfect person to model. It's finding out a few people who have done those very, very specific things. And it's got to be very specific. It's, I often use the analogy of tennis. If, if you want, if your goal is to become 
a great tennis player and you're picking up the racket for the first time, don't model Federer because he's he's gone so many steps above you that actually that's you, you're you're not cutting down your learning time. What you're doing is is jumping some essential steps. So find someone who's a few steps above you, um, you know, the, the local tennis coach who, who you can spend time with. And then once you're beyond that level, go beyond there. So model people that have done those goals before or have got part way to those goals. Um, and then then you've got to set yourself some time scales and, and get some leverage on those time scales. Um, my, my son, uh, who's now seven, has seen some of the visualizations I have on the wall. And one of them is a particular house, which is the next, the next house, which, which is in the catchment area for the next school we want for him. And um, he gave me some massive leverage the other day when he's lost his tooth. And he gave me money from the tooth fairy and said, uh, this is towards the house that we're going to get. Huh. Now, so talk, talk about pressure and, and living up to the expectations. <laughs> I, I now have to deliver on this house and I have absolute time scales to do it because we need to get into the catchment area for a school. Um, huh. So it might not be that specific for leverage, but finding a time scale. I mean, I often think about in health and fitness is, is if you've got a holiday to go on with friends. Now, mm. that, that is a great leverage and time scale to get, you know, in better shape or, or you know, start eating better. And, and that, that for me is a perfect example of, of leverage and time scale together because that date's not going to move and that date is going to expose you in, in the purest sense in a friendly environment. We don't want to have leverage in a dangerous way, but leverage and time scale to make sure you deliver on those goals. Um, and then... It's, it's about the 80-20 principle, deciding what are the things that are going to get you closest to those goals. So another book that I know that you're a big fan of is The One Thing. Um, so what's the one thing you could do such that by doing it, everything else will become easier and necessary? If, if you've got that result and focus and you know at this stage, you still don't know what the business and what's the vehicle to do it. But, but what you've done, if you've done so much work to make you realize, well, actually, to deliver this 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 goal, it has to be bigger than I was originally thinking, or actually it's nowhere near as big as I was originally thinking. And that really does start to clarify what, what the requirements for this business are. So it's about being effective to, to get towards those goals. Um, and then um, something that, that I've only really recently realized that is a key step that, that I've added that that is essential, and that's that's acknowledging your limiting beliefs. That, that is something that comes straight out of Tony Robbins. Uh, and it's all about writing down. He, he does it as the three things that, that either are the three biggest reasons that you know this, you know, you feel in your heart hearts this isn't going to happen, or the three limiting beliefs that are holding you back from, from doing this. Um, for example, for me, when I was, was transitioning from the security or, or, the, or the belief of a security of a job to to um to one of my previous businesses was the thought that oh no what happens if it all goes wrong you know the limiting belief was can i do this is it going to make enough money to be able to sustain my family mm-hmm. so that that limiting belief didn't serve me it, it held me back so writing them down and acknowledging them are so important because those limiting beliefs are the reasons you haven't already done it you know, we, we've all the reason we're listening to this podcast and the reason we're having this conversation, we, we've had this desire before. This isn't new. We want to do this. And, and it's those limiting beliefs that, that have have either stopped it from happening already or slowed it will slow it down in the future. So I think acknowledging them and then and then the, the most important part is is consciously and it's not going to happen instantly. Uh, unless you're with Tony, but um, mm. changing them to to, lim- to beliefs that serve you better. So uh, and, re- and reducing the risk of them. So for me, it, the fear there was, am I going to you know run out of money and 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 you know my my it's all going to stop tomorrow? Well, I, c- I can acknowledge that and go, well, what would happen if that did happen? Well, I can have enough money in the bank to survive for six months. And actually, by doing that, I've got more security than a job there because a job in the UK has a, a two month notice period. So in the, so that job gives me two months security. But this new business gives me six months security. So that limiting belief has just gone out the window. And, and what I've done is set myself up for success before I've even even started. Um, 
Uh, sorry, this is a long answer because I'm quite passionate yeah. about this. Having been through the anxiety of starting a business and, and the pain, it's, it's very real. And, and, and regret looking back on, I wish I'd done this, for me, comes from those limiting, limiting beliefs. Uh, and then you get to the bit that, that most people start off with, and that's deciding what business to do. Now, if, if you've done it the other way, way round and thought, right, I'm going to do this business. I, I love widgets. I'm going to do that. It's fun. It's nothing to do with my current job. So I'm going to love it because I hate my current job. What you do is you, you're you running away from what you're doing now. You're, you're not running towards the thing that's going to get you to your end result. Yeah. You're, you're running away from your current limiting beliefs or, or issues. So if you yeah. flip it and, and think, where do I want to get to? Who's done it already? When am I going to do it by? What's going to make me do it with my leveraging and, 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 and and incentive, I suppose. What's going to stop me getting there? How can I can I can I minimise the risk of that and and get more empowering attitudes? And and now I've changed that that limiting to belief into more powering affirmation. That I know I can make money. I've I've now done it so many times that I know I can. So if it did all went wrong tomorrow, never mind six months in the bank account. I know in a, in a, in a few weeks I I would have the, the next business started and that would be a success. So what an empowering way to approach approach life um mm. so now you've got this goal where you want to get to when you're going to do it what business is going to be the vehicle for that and and if you're like me in, in the kind of manager leader it has to be something you're passionate about if you're a true entrepreneur it's all about the numbers what's going to be the vehicle that get you there so the final bit for me is is a bit of of, of analysis it's market research the the, the you, you, everyone can just sit down for for a couple of hours and write down um, the industries that they would love to, to be working in. So what are you passionate about? Because you're going to be doing a lot more time on this than you expect. It's going to take a lot longer. You have to love it. it it's got to be something that, that you enjoy. Um, so, so write down the things you're passionate about. And then go on Google and look at Keyword Planner and, and Google Trends and see what's, what's a big market. Not, not what's going to be a big market, because I've made mistakes of, <clears throat> trying to get ahead of the market and the market never came yeah. but what's a, already a big market that that has that you can do better in so um an example this this for me is not an example of me but the perfect example of this was um a founder i was talking to the founder of mahabi slippers you feel familiar with for those um not no they're they're I, I don't know if they're just europe but they're very luxury slippers and and, and the founder of that was going through a similar process where he was doing some market research. Uh, he was putting together, I don't know if it was a, a business case or investor pack, but essentially he was documenting his ideas and trying to justify the thing he was passionate about was creating shoes. And he was loving the idea of that industries. And actually, the one he'd chosen to do was, was uh, flip-flops or thongs in, in Australia. And uh, what he was doing is looking into the, the search volume for for Javianas, I think it was, on, on um, Google. And then what he's doing is comparing it to other industries to see how big it was. And what he looked up was slippers just to compare the market size and show how massive the one he wanted to go into was. And actually, the slipper search volume was so much bigger that he was like, oh, I can't, I can't ignore this. What's going on here? So, so his original idea evolved into this other market that had so much bigger potential. And, and, and it's much easier to make money in a big market by taking a slice of that pie than it is to be number one in a very, very small market, even if it's growing. So for me, it's about finding an already decent sized market, which has got a lot of search volume or the equivalent of that offline. Uh, so people are already are looking for not necessarily your product, but looking for a solution. And then it's about seeing can you do a better job so so he looked then to see what slippers were available and he saw you know some local retailers uggs was doing something but no one was really captivating the market and he thought wow i can i can really do a great job here and and he did he went on to sell millions and millions so that is a very long answer to your question but it it flips how i think most people think of it which is which is actually thinking about the business last does that make sense it does and I think that's a great process to go through and not, not I guess uh, the punchline is don't be attached to an idea, go through a process and, and then 
as you said, let the actual idea be the last thing you come to as a logical conclusion from your analysis. So yeah, yeah be, being attached to an idea, I've, I've had that issue in the past and, and there's justifications like, oh, it's, it's huge in America. It's going to come over here soon and, and things yeah. like that. And, and, you know, occasionally that does happen, but it's a lot easier to be in a big market that's growing and go in and deliver and do a great job at that. Mm-hmm. It just, having been through the pain of the opposite side of that, I highly recommend that as an approach. And, and it's fine to have ideas up, up front, but stress test that, you know, is the market big enough? Is, is it a growing market? What's the competition like? Can I create something that's going to, you know, really make a difference to people and it's noticeably better? And can I continue to evolve beyond that so that when the competition do catch up, I've already come out with the next iteration and I can deliver on that. So for me, unless it meets that criteria, it's not, not a business I want to be in. That's great. It makes total sense. Thank you for sharing that. So I want to make sure we talk a little bit about your latest business, which is called The Restored. So I was wondering if you could just tell us what is The Restored and, and how did that business idea come about? Well, you've kind of gone through how your ideas come about, but how did this business specifically come about? Yeah, I I think um, you you summarized part of our mission at the beginning, and and that I'll I'll say it in full because it really does bring it all together. So our mission is uh, to empower people to restore their sleep, nutrition, and movement with products and practical advice that will help them feel significantly better. And and hopefully that's come across in, in everything I've said so far in that, we want to help people feel significantly better. You know, if, if you don't notice a massive difference, then you're not going to write a good review. You're not going to tell your friend. You're not going to come back to us. If you, if you have that mindset up front that, that we need to deliver massive value to people, to, to, to some of our customers, it's life-changing value. Um, so for me, having that, that mission in, in those categories is, is incredibly important because I, I've I've struggled with movement, as I said in the past, my back issues. So we still sell the, the back support as part of the restored. We've now sold a quarter of a million of those those back supports, and we've mm-hmm. had so many iterations of it. It's a product that, that if you've got back pain, it gives you that that feeling of well, that's where the names come from. It comes from our customers feeling restored, having the idea of I used to not feel I used to feel better than this. Um, and it's not about feeling perfect every day and, and having the ideal day. But if you're feeling run down, you want to feel get back to good. You want to feel noticeably, noticeably better. And, and the other areas that, that that I've had those issues in the past is sleep. Sleep. When I had um, that similar time of, as my back issues, my my son was having issues with sleep. And, and I had huge anxiety that I wasn't going to get a good night's sleep even when he did sleep well so um, being a parent um, just compounded the stresses of, of daily work so you, you've got a job and, and I was doing entrepreneurial things as well on the side uh, but, but also trying to give as much of myself to the family as possible and and then so, so I had all these thoughts in my mind going to bed and and stress of that if I don't get a good night's sleep tomorrow is going to be terrible so sleep was kind of a, a foundation of health that I had real issues with and, and through a lot of research and, and originally I thought the solution to that was more energy. I needed more caffeine, I needed nootropics, <laughs> which, which was one of those businesses that I looked into that again was big in the US but it, it, it never really came across to, to Europe. But actually talking it through with the experts who are now on our team, what I realized is, is my issue wasn't about my energy, getting more energy, it was about fixing my recovery. So the, the challenge um, there was looking at it in a very different way. When, when, you're, when you're hungry, you should eat a nutritious meal. When you're tired, you should get really great quality sleep or recovery. But what I was doing, like many people were doing, is, is when I was tired, I would have caffeine, which all it does is <laughs> just turns off your brain to realizing you're tired. It's not actually giving you much more energy, it's just tricking your brain into to not being tired, and it's compounding an issue. Now, I'm not against caffeine, but what it should do is realize that the issue there is you're not getting quality sleep. So, so we develop sleep, uh, sleep supplements with nutrients from whole food extracts, and most importantly, from stuff you can't get from food. There's certain nutrients that if you're sleep deprived, you're missing, that you need to, to supplement to get back to good. So 
Uh, we combine that with, with our, our, our sleep experts who give practical advice. Again, it's the 80-20 principle. If you're tired, you don't want to have, you know, 400 things to get the good night's sleep. Tell me the three things that are going to make the difference. Give me the nutrients I need. Deliver, over deliver. And that's why we, we see significant improvements in that, because after, after a period of time, people can look back and go, wow, I feel restored. I feel significantly better. And then, and then that evolved into nutrition because I'm, I'm gluten intolerant. Again, all of these businesses come out of a selfish need to solve <laughs> my own problems. And, and I'm passionate about helping others who who've, who've, are in the same situation. So we have nutrients, you know, through the use of multivitamins or omega-3 or, or food that generally after taking it compound things like reducing inflammation and things like that, that go beyond the normal uh, things in those areas because we have such this clear vision of making people feel restored that by taking these nutrients, actually after taking them a while, you look back and go, why do I feel significantly better? You know, our probiotic, for example, is, is, is helping with people in their absorption of food. If, if you're eating great but not absorbing it or, or you're, you've got IBS or, or just, just feel bloated, then once you remove that and look back, you go, why didn't I do this before? So, so for me, it's all about delivering on that promise of significantly helping people feel better. Yeah, that's great. It's a great mission. And I like how you approach it quite holistically. You're not, you're not a, a sleep supplement company alone. You're not a nutrition company alone. It's, it's all those things together, movement, mindset, all those, those sort of key pillars that that they kind of all need to work in balance, which which I love. So, yeah, it comes back to that thing I was saying earlier about the process for creating a product or service. First, for us, it was what's the problem. So, so sleep one, for example, it may not have been supplements. It may have been something completely else. What we realised is, is we looked at what our customers were telling us was the problem. So, there's many different ways to approach sleep. You know, is it about getting to sleep faster? Is it about having quality of sleep? Is it about how many times you wake up in the night? Is it about your energy the next day? Is it about being so deep you're not woken up? There's so many different facets of sleep. And what we realized through lots of these years of testing and back and forth from market research, and again, it always takes a lot longer. <laughs> what, we've, what we've realized is, or what we realized a few years ago, because we've now been selling this product for a few years, is that it was more about the result people wanted. They want to feel less tired the next day. So, so what's, how do you get that result? Well, to feel less tired and have more energy, it's about the quality of the sleep. So, so once we knew that, we knew that there was many different ways of doing that. There's the glasses you're wearing now, you know, about reducing the, uh, the light in the evening. That was one solution. But other people were already doing that great. Um, then there's about the nutrients your body's missing for quality of the sleep. And we saw, you know, it wasn't so much a gap in the market. I wanted that product because that was my my issue. Um, and then there's the advice of practical things that people don't know about. So we can deliver that advice and, and not sell that. We just give that advice away. You know, obvious things in hindsight about having a regular wake up time and go, go, go to sleep time. That is advice that everyone knows. But actually, we go into the importance of that. And, and that alone will, will make a massive difference to your sleep. So that, that process of coming to these products wasn't a case of, I've got an idea, I want to do a sleep supplement. It was, what is the problem we want to solve? We want to help people feel less tired. Is, is, and, and then we realized that that's where most people were. What's the best way to do that? And, and, and it was, wasn't until we got right down the bottom that, that we realized that, 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 that the advice and the nutrients was the best way to do that. So again, it's, it's kind of following that model on what's the result you want and then the product is the very last thing you think of. Yep, makes total sense. Beginning with the end in mind, as you said before. So any any major challenges with, with this business, the restored, was it, is it kind of one of the, is it a case where all your previous businesses kind of, all the learnings from them ended up culminating in this this one and it was all smooth sailing or, or were there still some some big challenges with this one um i'll be very surprised if any entrepreneur ever says it's it's, it's smooth sailing <laughs> yeah um i i think um because now we've got a reputation for or certainly a, 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 a mission for helping people feel significantly better what it does is it raises the bar so high that every product 
has to deliver on that. So whatever product you come in for, whether or not you've got a bad back and you come in for a back support, whether or not you need better sleep, whether or not your nutrients aren't as good as they used as they should be, so you're feeling run down, you know, whatever way you come through, whatever that first product or advice is, we have to over deliver. And, and what that does is sets the bar so high that our product development means it's even longer than that painful long process that I talk about. So we're now doing clinical trials, for example. I mean, the, 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 the clinical trials, for anyone who's, who's not gone through it, take a long time. And there's a lot of hoops to jump through. And it's going to take another 18 months from, from this point onwards. But we do it because it will give people that, that, that reaffirmation that this will be something that will make them feel significantly better. And, you, and what's so tough about something like a clinical trial is you have to publish your results even if it fails. So yeah. y you have to create, again, it's about having that end goal and mission result. We want products that, you know, third parties and everyone can say it's the gold standard. Th these are, this is advice and products that will make you feel significantly better. You'll feel restored. It's fine for us to say it. And we've fortunately got thousands of customers who say it, but we want, you know, third party scientists and, and we, everyone to, to cement that message. So mm -hmm. it's hard. And, and, by setting those standards, it means that things like clinical trials, new products coming out take longer. So, you know, it depends on what point you come and visit us. You'll see some products saying coming soon. Now, those products have been ready for a long time, but we are, we're not prepared to release them until they've been through even more tests, even more tests. And at the time we release them, if that's the first product you ever have with us, that will make you feel significantly better uh, for whatever the reason is. And we've actually got a, a survey on our site that kind of points you into, you know, everyone's different. For some person, if, if they're sleeping fine, our sleep advice and product won't make a big difference to them. You know, but if, if, if you're sleeping fine, you've got a back problem, we can help you with that. So focus on the thing that's going to make the biggest difference first. So the challenge for us, I think, is, is, is how long product development takes just because our standards are high and, and um you know, I, I wouldn't lower those standards. So uh, it's a challenge we've, um, we're working on. Mm, love it. Yeah, you've got some great products um, available and then sounds like plenty more in the pipeline. So sort of kind of towards the end of the interview here, Richard, it's been awesome conversation so far. So I just kind of want to close it out with a few, few questions. What's, what's next for you with the Restored? It sounds like that's definitely your your main project, but um, is it mostly just releasing new products and going through all these trials, the clinical trials for that, for some of them and, and just sort of building out that range or have you got any specific goals for the business coming up? Yeah, I, I mean, again, uh, my whole team is, is very re results driven and it's all about delivering on that mission. And, and as I said, fortunately, we've got thousands of customers and you'll see some video testimonials on our website who who it's helped but we are not yet the default go-to for all of those problems and that's the next stage for me it's 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 making us um help help more people but more importantly be the first thought in people's mind so if we're coming from a place where we are generally helping people feel significantly better we want to help as many people feel significantly better so that's the next stage for me. And, and the clinical trials will help with that. And yeah, it's just a case of um, delivering on that mission is, 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 is really where we want to go. Awesome. And is there anything I haven't asked you or just anything you really want to make sure that you pass on to the audience before we finish up here, Richard? Well, I think you've done an excellent job of, of pulling out <laughs> things from my brain that, that I've gotten. And as I said, some great research of things that, that I didn't realize were online. Um, <laughs> I would say, you know, if, if anyone's got any follow-up questions, obviously I'll keep an eye on the, the comments on on, uh, on this podcast. But yeah, check us out at therestored.com because there's our survey on there and you can help, help. hopefully we can help you that way. Um, we are constantly growing, so keep an eye on our website for, if you want to join the team and grow with us. We, As I said, we're based in Winchester in Hampshire in the UK, but actually we've got a worldwide team and, and that comes from the four-hour work week in in that we care more about having the best people irrespective of their location. So yeah, if you want, want to join us, check us out through there. Um, 
yeah and and uh if if anyone's got any follow-up questions then as i said i'll i'll I'll, uh, I'll keep an eye out for the comments on this and and hopefully um just want to add value and and uh anyone who's been in that situation which i've been which is about getting inspired or just getting going my advice is is just to test something learn it think about what you want to get your result and go for it love it it's a great message to end on i think everyone listening go check out the restored.com they've got some great products and as you can tell from the last hour richard's a really thorough guy and and the products he creates are a reflection of that and so i think go check out the restore that's probably the best way to to connect connect with him and and see what he's up to and and don't reach out and ask him to buy a coffee <laughs> <laughs> I, I i feel bad about saying that i should say uh our social <laughs> handles are all at the restored way and my team um will be monitoring those as well if you've got any questions uh for me directly that's probably the best way of doing it uh, it, it it's it's more a courtesy to say that i never check my own social accounts so uh, mm. uh it, I, it's more of a me saying sorry i'm useless at responding but yeah <laughs> If you've got any questions that we can't answer through you, then then check us out through the Restored Way on social or the Restored.com, and um, my team will, will get through to me, and uh, we'll kind of try and add value to anyone through that way. Awesome. So I'll make sure they're all linked up in the show notes so people can easily find it. But Richard, thank you very much for coming on the show today. It's been fascinating hearing your story, going from management consulting to, to online business and the journey you've gone through to get to where you are today and you really shared a lot of value for the audience today about your learnings from your journey so thank you very much you're welcome you're welcome i should say thank you to you my, my i had lunch with alex icon last week who's a friend of mine he's actually an investor and he and mimi are investors in the restored have been for about three years and it was actually um through conversations uh with him originally who recommended you and your podcast and, and actually we've we've communicated online back and forth uh for years uh, without realizing <laughs> that it would come to this so uh again thank you for uh, everything you uh put out there yeah absolutely i'm glad that we could finally connect so again thank you for coming on and everyone listening hope you all have a great day and thanks for listening Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to this interview with Richard. I hope you got a lot of value from the interview. And if you did, I've got a real quick favor to ask. If you use Apple Podcasts to listen to this, can you go into the app and please leave me a rating and review? Because that really helps me out in terms of getting the show ranking higher, exposing it to more people so they can hear these interviews and get the value from the guests. And if you don't use Apple Podcasts, You can still help me out. Take a screenshot of yourself listening to this episode. Post it to Instagram stories. Make sure you tag me in that. So that's at Jay Harris, which is J-H-A-R-R-I-S-S. And if you could do one of those two things, it would mean a lot to me and really help me out. So hope you can do that. Hope you enjoyed this interview and hope you have a great day.